Life is precious and oftentimes fleeting, and now more than ever, we can never predict how long the ones we love and cherish will be with us. So it's important to live life to its fullest. And no one knows this better than my next guest, Maria Quibond Whitesell, a meteorologist from our Los Angeles affiliate Fox 11, who I've gotten to know. Maria watched her late husband, famed television writer and producer, Sean Whitesell, courageously face the grim diagnosis of glioblastoma multiform. It's an incredibly aggressive brain tumor. Cherishing life and rediscovering joy are among the themes of her beautiful, intimate memoir, You Can't Do It Alone, A Widow's Journey Through Loss, Grief, and Life After. And Maria joins us now. Maria, thank you for coming on. I'm so happy that you wrote this book and you're sharing with all of America. It's deeply personal, it's intimate. Why was it important for you to write this story about your family's experience? Ah, Dr. Oz, thank you, first of all, for having me on the show. Uh, you know, when we were diagnosed, and I say we because I feel like I went through it with him as well, our whole family, um, we asked those questions of why, right? Why us? Why him? He, he's so young. He was healthy. He ate right. He exercised. And um, so in, in asking these questions, we figured it must be because I wore a microphone every day and that he was a writer by profession and we needed to shine a light on this disease for which there is no cure. And so we thought, well, maybe part of our purpose is to write a story, write our story about this disease. And he was supposed to write this, not me. He was the writer. Um, so my debut book is, is this book and, and it's an important one. And I'm just so glad that it's out there. You know, I, I I first heard about what was going on from your brother-in-law, Patrick, who I have been close with. And I know that the whole story sort of stuck up on you. What ran through your head when you first received the news of Sean's diagnosis with a brain cancer that's not really curable or treatable? You know, we were, I remember that day so vividly in that little basement doctor's office in uh, Santa Monica in St. John's. and. I tell you, we were paralyzed. I, I certainly was, and I, I couldn't see beyond the the mouths of the doctors uh, just moving up and down after he said, inoperable, terminal, no cure, and that was it. And I just remember standing there, or sitting there, and, and my mouth was agape, and, and I think the doctor saw that too, because we were just in shock and, and just disbelief. Let me show the audience exactly what Sean was diagnosed with and why it was such a stunning Observation. So this is what the brain looks like. This is the front of the brain. The, the spinal column is down here. And I want to show you what happens when you have this glioblastoma multiform. It's a highly malignant tumor. And I, I know it looks angry and ugly in part because it is, but you see how strands come out from the actual tumor? This is why you just can't cut it out because it spreads so quickly into the brain, multiple parts of the brain, and you can't cut out this much brain. And so even with aggressive treatments consisting of surgery and chemotherapy, this cancer is an extremely poor prognosis because by the time you know it's there, it's already gone into parts of the brain uh, that are untreatable. Median survival for that reason is one year to 16 months. And it is incredibly sobering to hear from a doctor about this diagnosis. I've had several friends who've had to cope with this. So Maria, how inv invaluable was the support of your friends and family as you dealt with this new life-changing diagnosis? Oh, it was everything. Um, our family, my Whitesell family, my uh, Sean's brothers, his parents, my family, our circle of friends, they were right there with us from the moment uh, we got the diagnosis. And, and it's part of the reason why I wrote the book, you know, you, you can't do it alone. And without them, I know how much darker this journey would have been. They were there with us every step of the way. And you know, they still are. And I'm so grateful and thankful how I, you know, Sean may not be here physically, but his brothers um, are just, they're going to be with Gus tonight, actually. One of his uncles, he's going to spend the night there. So they've just, they've really just picked up where Sean would have probably done everything for him. Um, his brothers, their wives, uh, my extended family, they've just been amazing to us. Yeah, family matters. One of the most beautiful passages of the book for, for me was, your description of the final vacation that you're able to take with Sean, your husband, as well as your son, Gus. He was four at the time. What did that trip mean to you? That trip was everything. Uh, we timed it so perfectly because it was a, a, at a time where, you know, he was doing really well. Some of the, the treatments that he was getting was actually making fe him feel okay. 
That trip, we slept very little, I will tell you that, uh, because we wanted to just take in every moment of every day that we were there. And that trip was so special and uh, is part of the daddy memories that we talk about all the time with Gus, and it'll be with us forever. Up next, Maria reveals the importance of maintaining hope in the face of all hopelessness and what it means to live each day like a month and each month like a year. We've been sharing Maria Kurban Whitesell's personal story of loss, grief, and life after her late husband's death from aggressive brain cancer. We're back with Maria Shidatharab. You can't do it alone. So physicians try to give advice on medicine, but sometimes we don't have much to say in that regard, as is with this condition. And I know one physician told you that you th he thought you should choose joy in spite of all this adversity, which is a, a challenging recommendation on the surface. Oh, yeah. I that, that office visit was sobering. I remember Sean saying he wanted to punch that doctor in the face uh, because he, we talked about it after. It's like, how, how can we possibly choose joy with this diagnosis and this prognosis? But you know, he did us a favor that day because we really did take stock of each day. And he told us something else that, that, that really stayed with us. And he said, you know, this is a gift uh, I, I know it's hard to see that, but this is a gift because you have an actual timeline, which most people don't. And I need you to leave my office today and take each day and treat it as if it were a month. And each month that you get, treat it as if it, as a, it was a year uh, for you. So go out there and, and live life, choose joy and make memories. And I remember we went home and we thought that was such an impossible feat, but we were actually able to do it. And we would, you know, go to bed every night late and we would t take stock of every day and what, what happened in that day and what gave us joy. And it was a, the small, simple things in life. It wasn't just traveling to Hawaii, of course, but it was watching Gus and seeing the, the new things he discovered and, and the new words he would learn and, you know, the, the animals that, that we would discover together, like this video, we went on a trip to San Diego and, you know, we got to see these ducks up close and just the laughs and the tickle fights and pillow fights that we would have every night. That's what we took stock of every night. And, and it just, it really filled us up. We, we just felt full every night. You write about finding your support group. You call them the seven samurai. And they were going <laughs> through similar experiences as you. How, how critical was that? finding, that observation? You know, they were everything. I, I just wish I would have found them sooner. They were a, a group of people who were caregivers for brain cancer patients, and I found them through the uh, brain, care, uh, brain Cancer Caregiver Support Group at uh, UCLA. And each one of them had a spouse that was ahead of me. And I don't know if it was just kismet or, 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 or whatever, but uh, they were so crucial for me. They were these guideposts, these lampposts on this very dark journey. And I just couldn't imagine not having them because it would have been an even darker, more painful journey for us. They um, were able to give me advice on what to expect. They um, laughed with me. They cried with me. They were a group of people that I still get together with today, by the way, we still get together every couple of months or so. And, you know, we've, we've, we've talked about love and, and, and loss and pain, but now we also talk about joy and even some new loves that uh, uh, surprisingly some of them have found. So uh, the samurai, the support group that, that, that we should all find our village because we can't get through life without them. It's, it's just, it would be so much more difficult. So one of my big takeaways from your book was no matter what condition you're suffering from, find people who have the same issues because guess what? They're finding solutions just like you and together we can be each other's safety net. To read more about Maria's journey and how to cope with incredible loss, you can check out her wonderful book, You Can't Do It Alone. God bless you, Maria. I'll see you in Los Angeles. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'll be right back.